So good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to all of you here in person this morning. I appreciate you coming uh, on a beautiful, sunny, and very rare, sunny Seattle day. For those of you watching us uh, streaming on Facebook right now, hello to you as well. Just wanted to mention first, my name is Pat O'Connor, and I co-write the Rick Steves Ireland Travel Guidebook. I'm actually flying over there tomorrow for two months. So this is our guidebook here. I'll be over there uh, leading a couple of tours and then doing the guidebook research for next year's 20. 13 edition. Um, just very quickly, I wanted to mention that we have a great sale going today for 20% off on all of our merchandise and guidebooks. That's right around the corner um, down here at our travel center. For those of you in person and for those of you uh, watching us streaming on Facebook, that same sale is available to you as well at ricksteves.com. And uh, you just used to need to use a festival code, or a code I should say that is festival, our promotional code just the word festival. So um, thanks very much. Um, Rick and I sort of have a, a playful little debate about Ireland. He always calls Ireland the rainy Italy. <laughs> and I can kind of see his point. You know, it's, uh, it's a place full of history, full of people who are in love with life and wear their emotions on their sleeves and beautiful place. But I prefer to think of Italy as a dried up Ireland, okay? <laughs> Okay, we'll just kind of get our Irish pride going here at least for the next hour and a half or so. How many of you have Irish heritage? Wow, most of you. How many of you have been to Ireland? Great, quite a few. How many of you are planning a trip to Ireland? Yeah, good, good. How many of you wear green on St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> cool, okay, good, good. So we're all part of the same clan um, on St. Patrick's Day anyway. Um, by the way, clan is an Irish word. We have lots of words in English that we've adopted from the Irish language. Clan is short for clanad, which means family. And um, so that uh, terminology was trans transported across to the states, particularly into the Appalachians. We refer to those clan feuds and so on. A lot of Irish and Scotch-Irish people settled in the Appalachians. So um, let's start our travels around Ireland here. When we're looking at the map of Ireland, it's about 300 miles north to south, maybe 150 miles east to west. What this means is that you're never more than 75 miles from the ocean. And what that means is that you've got a very mild climate, right? It's rare to get a lot of snow in Ireland. Even though when you're in Dublin, you're as far north as Edmonton, Canada. And when you're up here on the northern coast, Donegal, you're as far north as Ketchikan, Alaska on the panhandle up there. So it is pretty far north. Longest days of the year in late June, of course, you'll have really long days there. We're looking at a map, though, that shows the four different provinces of Ireland, the ancient provinces. Uh, we've got Leinster, Munster, Connaught, and Ulster. Now, Ulster makes up nine counties, and only six of those counties are part of Northern Ireland. We sometimes hear uh, Northern Ireland called Ulster, and that's true. Northern Ireland is a subsection within Ulster, uh, but uh, Northern Ireland is also part of a different country, the United Kingdom, versus the Republic of Ireland there in the south. So let's start moving around here. Um, I like to fly nonstop to Europe when I can, um, or at least I don't want to be stuck in between if you f catch my drift here. Um, fl flying from here to Amsterdam nonstop, from here to London nonstop, from here to Paris nonstop, from here to Frankfurt nonstop, and then make a short connection. My thinking is, you know, I'd much rather be stuck here, either here at home if the flight is canceled or something, or stuck in Europe, but not stuck in Dallas or Chicago or Minneapolis or somewhere right along the way. So if you can book far enough in advance, you should be able to get some nonstop flights across over to Europe and then make a short hop over to Ireland. There are no nonstops from here in Seattle that go straight to Ireland. Now, if you are combining your travels with uh, the United Kingdom or Britain, um, you can connect over to Ireland using the ferry system. There are three different ferry ports that go across, two from Wales and one from Scotland. It's about a three-hour crossing in between. But if all I was doing was tying London together with Ireland, I would fly it. You know, don't spend a whole day of your valuable time surface travel getting all the way across to the Welsh coast and then taking a, a three-hour uh, uh, boat ride from there across to Dublin. Just fly it, unless you want to do some sightseeing in the rest of Britain. Now, the thing about Ireland is that it is the youngest per capita population in the EU. So about 40% of the population are under the age of 25. It's a very youthful population um, and a very vibrant population, kind of a, a baby boom going on there right now. 
When we talk about traveling around Ireland, I'll kind of go through some of the nuts and bolts of traveling here first before we start looking at destinations in particular. Um, when you're traveling around Ireland, the trains are fine where they exist, but the problem is that they don't serve the country as well as some of the other European countries. Basically, a third of the people live in Dublin, so all trains lead to Dublin. And that means that if you're on the West Coast, you might not have the train service that you need in Ireland. So as an example, if you're here in Tralee and you want to go to Galway, you've got to ricochet across the country by train. So when you can't get there by train, you can augment that by bus instead, going across uh, Ireland by bus. Now, having said all of that, my favorite tr mode of transportation in Ireland is by car, and we'll be talking about that for sure. Um, here's a, a bus. Um, I, a few years ago, I took a bus ride um, from Kenmare in County Kerry to Dingle in County Kerry. It took me four hours, and I had to take two transfers. I can drive that same thing in two hours. So if you're debating whether or not to go by car or by train, just understand, you know, buses and trains are fine, but they'll put you in slow motion compared to a car, and a car will get you to all the little nooks and crannies that you want to go to. This is actually myself back in 1981 on my very first trip to Europe, and I am, believe it or not, reading Rick's very first edition of Europe through the back door. Yeah. On a train, you know, you can sit there, you can read a book, write a postcard, take a nap, and you meet a lot of great locals. But again, the car gives you total freedom. Now, at that same time in the summer of 81 that I was doing this, there was this long-haired hippie freak named uh, Rick Steves out in the bogs, and he was out there writing his second edition of the book, and I had no idea that years later the two of us would be able to team up on, uh, on our Ireland book that I do every year now since the year 2002. Now, in Ireland, they use the euro. The euro at the moment is worth about $1.30. That's um, in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland, they use the British pound, which at the moment is worth about $1.60. So the euro is uh, almost 10 years old now. It's, it's not a big adjustment. It's uh, pretty straightforward. These are the countries that use the euro. Actually, we need to update this because now Slovenia and Slovakia also use the euro. So you can pull money out of an ATM machine in Helsinki and spend it in Athens or Lisbon or Dublin. But now look at the island of Ireland here and look at this little chunk up here. That's Northern Ireland. And of course, as I just mentioned, they use the British pound. Uh, ATM machines are the way to go for cash. Um, the uh, traveler's checks are really dying out, uh, kind of a dinosaur is slowly dying out. ATM machines are open 24 hours a day, and you get a good bank exchange rate. The thing about an ATM machine, though, is that you'll get dinged with a fee every time you use it. So rather than use it every day and pull out a little bit of money, you know, maybe go twice a week and pull out a big chunk of money instead. And do keep it safely tucked away in your money belt, because unfortunately there are pickpockets even in mist kissed Ireland. Um, so yeah, wear a money belt and you'll be fine. Also call your credit card company before you go to make sure that they know where you're going so that they don't uh, freeze your card thinking that a thief has taken it to Belfast or something. Um, just a good idea to do that as well. Um, there are some great little city buses that will drive around on tours, little uh, tours around to the 15 or 20 main uh, interesting spots in town, in the bigger towns. This happens to be Galway, right in front of the Tourist Information Office. The Tourist Information Office is a good resource for you guys for uh, maps and for finding out about festivals. And if you ever really get in a pinch and you don't have a room, they can book you a room as well, uh, based on their database of uh, approved lodging that meets certain standards. So um, just know that that's kind of a fallback. Uh, in our guidebooks, we have our very best options, but uh, you always have the tourist information office as a fallback. Now for sightseeing, there's a fantastic card here called the Heritage Card. And this will get you into the 20, or pardon me, the 80 or so um, most important castles and monuments and parks. And it will, um, you know, just you just buy it once and you're good to go for all these uh, government-owned castles and parks and gardens and mansions and so on. Um, about 20 to 22 euros, as I recall, for one person. So if you're going to see half a dozen sites, this will pay for itself, plus it'll save you from waiting in lines. You just buy it at any tourist information office, like the one we just saw in the previous picture. Or there's a second guide that can be useful as well. There is no overlap on this pass, I should say, not guide. This is the Heritage Island pamphlet, similar sounding. But this pamphlet covers privately owned establishments, like crystal factories or um, 
uh, brewery tours or those types of things. This um, is best for couples because primarily what you're getting is buy one, the other one goes in free. So if you're traveling alone, it doesn't quite pay off as much. If you're traveling alone, you'll get about a 10 or 20% discount instead. So it doesn't quite pay off when you're traveling alone unless you're doing a lot of sightseeing. But between the two, the public, uh, publicly owned, or I should say the government, governmentally owned sites here on this card and the privately owned here, this one costs about seven euros. So for about 27, 28 euros, which is under $40, you've got all your sites seen covered. You buy both of these at the tourist information office in the first town you come to and then you're good to go. Sometimes I just buy them right at Dublin airport, right when I land and just get it out of the way and then I'm footloose and fancy free. Now for lodging, um, we try to find every year locally owned, uh, friendly, clean, um, good value places to sleep in. And uh, this happens to be one of my favorites in a little town called Trim. This place has a story because it is a former Victorian maternity hospital, of all things. And a really cozy little place. You know, we do list a few chain hotels, but we're primarily not looking for those unless there's really not any other options. We like to put you in touch with, with the small uh, merchants and the locals who are you know, more representative of the culture that you've gone so far to see. So you can get a great room like this in a and b for about 80 euros, uh, roughly. 80 euros is maybe $110. That's two people in a room, so you're spending 55 to $60 per person in the countryside for a room like this, en suite with a bathroom. If you're in Dublin, it'll cost you about a third more. Uh, Dublin's still a very expensive city. And you get to meet these wonderful people, um, like Chrissy and Tom here in Kinsale, a couple of my favorite, favorite Irish people. They'll sit you down at their breakfast table in their kitchen and they'll make you, you know, breakfast and they chat with you and, and jokes and just, you know, good fellowship. I really love meeting people like this and I really um, um, advocate um, trying to stay locally as much as you can. Now, a breakfast in Ireland is something that's really hearty. Um, in some places in Europe, you'll just get a roll and some yogurt and maybe a piece of fruit and some juice, coffee. In Ireland, you get a cooked breakfast. So you start with fruit and toast and juice, coffee, Eggs, here we go, tomatoes, sausage, and this, then this mysterious looking object right here. That is black pudding, and black pudding is sausage made from pig's blood. So beware of anything on your plate that looks like a hockey puck. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. Um, also, just to mention briefly, if... Uh, if you're traveling on a super tight budget, there are hostels. We used to call them youth hostels, but really people of any age can stay in a hostel, except in Bavaria, one state in Germany, everywhere else. You can be any age and stay in a hostel. And um, we list the best ones in our guidebooks uh, in any town that we feel is, is worthy of it. Now, driving. Yes, they don't drive on the wrong side of the road, you guys. They drive on the other side of the road, okay? Um, and, you know, an Irish road... It's really not my side of the road or your side of the road. It's, it's just kind of a shared cooperative adventure. Um, <laughs> um, by the, you, you do get used to it. You do get used to driving on the other side of the road. But um, you can't be in a hurry, so that means you have to get an early start. You have to have a good map. It helps to have a patient navigator next to you. I pull over frequently to let any faster local person scoot on by me. Um, and uh, it's, you, know, you do get used to it. It is the best way to get around. Now, keep in mind, first of all, that you can save about 30% by getting a stick shift over an automatic. But, you're sitting on the other side of the car with the stick shift in your left hand, driving on the other side of the road. So, you know, at least the, the, the brake and gas and, and clutch are all the same place that you're used to it. That's something to be thankful for. Um, and the stick shift, you know, the H pattern of a stick shift, you know, first, second, and so on, that's the same as well. So some things are the same, but, um, you know, you, 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 you do get used to it. So um, I just had to kind of give it to you straight there. Now, this is fun for me. I love driving down a little tiny Irish lane. Um, there are little pullouts here. If another car came the other direction, whichever one of us came to this little pullout first would pull into the pullout 
and blink our lights and let the other guy go by. Um, the Irish are generally courteous drivers. It's we tourists who are fouling things up over there. <laughs> now, um, Irish roads are beautiful um, uh, out in the countryside, but you have to be a cautious driver because you never know what's going to be around the corner. You got to be a, 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 a careful driver because around the corner could be a tractor or a couple of uh, pedestrians or maybe some of these guys or uh, a few of those guys and even sometimes one of these guys. So you just really have to be a careful driver and, uh, and uh, take your time as you're, as you're getting around there. I figure I can average about one kilometer a minute in Ireland. Here in the States, I figure I can average a mile an hour, right? Or probably a mile a minute, not an hour, mile a minute. You know, if I'm driving from here to Portland, what is it, 200 miles, you know, it might take me, uh, you know, two and a half hours or something. In Ireland, it's going to take you lots longer because the roads are narrower. They're building new roads. They're building some highways, but it's a slow process. So when you're looking at a map and you see a distance in kilometers, about a, mile, about a kilometer per minute, which is about 40 miles an hour on average in Ireland. Now, you do need a good map, because when you're looking at a street sign like this in Ireland, you've got to have some patience. They are converting from miles to kilometers right now. So on this um, street sign, you see to Ballinadee, it's seven kilometers. But to Kinsale, it's seven miles. If you see KM, that's kilometers. If you see nothing, it's miles. So it's 39 kilometers to Cork, but it's five kilometers to kill Britain. So, or five miles, rather, to kill Britain. So just kind of roll with it. You know, you're over there experiencing another culture, and, and uh, again, you'll get used to it. This is my brother Tim, and I took him to Ireland in 1995, and we uh, rented a car, and we were in Dingle, and the brakes started to squeak, so we went into O'Connor motor company here. We're proud members of the O'Connor clan and we said we'll get our brakes fixed here and we slept great that night because we knew that if those brakes failed the next day our kin would still get our business here. <laughs> Keep it in the family no matter what, right? Okay, let's start traveling around the country. Dublin, biggest city in Ireland, the, really the most important or the most um, uh, visited site in Dublin has to be Trinity College because it has a wonderful illuminated manuscript called the Book of Kells. Now the lines in to see this can be quite long so you want to make sure that you find out the opening hours and either go early in the day or late in the day because midday you could be standing outside for 45 minutes or something waiting to get in. But this is one of the illuminated manuscripts of the Book of Kells. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, the scriptures, copied down on calfskin vellum way back 1,200 years ago in a little island that's now part of Scotland called Iona. And it was raided by the Vikings, and they started massacring the monks, and the monks fled with their precious manuscripts. The Vikings, by the way, were raiding not because they were anti-Christian, but more that they were raiding for the plunder of the uh, jeweled book covers, the golden chalices, the silver candle holders, and... Uh, the monks just were massacred in between. So um, anyway, uh, they moved to uh, the center of Ireland. These particular monks from Iona, they went to Kells, and that's why we call it the Book of Kells. And the library at Trinity College is, is gorgeous. Uh, I believe one scene of one of the Harry Potter movies was filmed in this. It's uh, just a lovely, lovely old um, uh, structure. The Guinness Brewery is a holy pilgrimage for some people. <laughs> When you walk into the lobby of the Guinness Brewery, you're walking over this glass plate here, plexiglass, I should say. The original lease that Arthur Guinness signed is right here. And you can see the terms. It says, this is the original 9,000-year lease signed by Arthur Guinness in 1759. 9,000 years at 40 pounds a year. Pretty good deal. At the time, he didn't know. You know, there were many breweries in town. He might have gone out of business. It was a risk for him, but he certainly made a success of it. And Guinness uh, has this wonderful advertising campaign. You've probably seen a lot of their sort of colorful, cartoonish um, looking ads all over the place on the sides of pubs and, and so on. To save some money, get a carvery lunch in a pub, pub grub, comfort food, not gourmet, but filling and economical. In Dublin, the city is uh, cut in half by the Liffey River, the north side and the south side. We're standing on the south side here at the Halfpenny uh, Pedestrian Bridge. 
And uh, I was there on St. Patrick's Day in 2006, and it was just a zoo. It was lots and lots of fun. Uh, in the Temple Bar area of Dublin, kind of the party zone, uh, lots and lots of fun, big crowds, lots of great people watching. <laughs> the Dutch soccer team was in town, and they were playing the Irish. <laughs> this guy's about six foot eight, so nobody's going to argue with him, but... His friend's looking at him going, what were you thinking of? <laughs> okay, now we're outside of Dublin, and um, if you're looking for a less expensive Dublin sleeping option, there's a couple of great ones that are only about 20 minutes out of town on the light rail dart system. This is Dunleary, which is also the ferry port, one of the three that goes over to uh, Wales. Very quiet, nice little town, made famous in, by um, James Joyce in the uh, novel Ulysses. It starts in this round tower right here. Uh, and then the other town on the north side is Hoth, which is a fishing village. Again, quiet. The rooms are about a third less in these two little suburbs than what you'll pay in Dublin. The trade-off is that uh, you need to take a 20-minute light rail ride, no connections, just straight in and out, real easy, and we, we write those up in the guidebook. Now, this is Dublin um, in the center of town on O'Connell Street Bridge. And I'm going to show you this same view about, what, 96 years ago. What the heck's going on? Well, that would have been 1916. Easter Monday of 1916, rebels in Ireland rose because they knew the British were tied up with World War I and distracted, and the rebels rose, tried to get a national revolution going while the British back were turned because Ireland was part of the United Kingdom at that time. And the British came in with gunboats and troops, and within a week they put down this rebellion, the Easter Uprising. But uh, the rebel leaders were taken here to Kilmainham Jail, and if they'd just thrown him in, in the clinker and thrown away the key, Irish history would have been completely different because these rebels were not, all, all of them were not um, well thought of by Irish people whose town had been destroyed because of their uprising. But when the 16 major leaders were executed, suddenly they were martyrs, and uh, public opinion reversed about 180 degrees, and within a half a dozen years, Ireland was on the road with limited autonomy from Britain, and by 1947 was a republic completely separate from Britain, other than the six counties of the north, which chose to remain uh, with the United Kingdom, and we'll talk about them later. This is the, um, the uh, Stonebreaker's Yard where those rebel leaders were, were shot. So this is sacred ground to the Irish, and... Uh, the closest thing I can think of in our own history would be to go to the Arizona Memorial or something like that in, in Honolulu. Um, the Irish feel super strongly about this particular place because it's the birth of their modern republic after being under the thumb of the British for 750 years. These are the Irish leaders' names, and you'll see it's written in Irish, the language of Irish first, and then in English second. The general post office is where the rebel leaders held out, kind of like an Alamo um, for that week. And here's a statue of James Joyce looking across there, the famous novelist, looking up at the Irish flag, which is a tricolor of green, white, and orange. Green representing the nationalist Catholic perspective, orange representing the unionist Protestant perspective, and white representing the, the hoped for peace between them. This was a gift from France. Um, to Irish rebels back in the 1840s, and when Ireland finally got its independence, they adopted it as their national flag. Trinity Col or, pardon me, uh, the Dublin Castle here is where the British turned over control of the country to the Irish in a ceremony right here in this, in this courtyard. And the sad thing is that within a few months or less than a year, the Irish were at each other's throats over the terms of the treaty uh, and that's a very involved thing that I don't have time to get into now, but the first shots of the Irish Civil War were fired here at the Four Courts, which is their Supreme Court building. If you're trying to track your genealogy and having trouble tracking your genealogy in Ireland, part of the reason is because the public records office in this building went up in flames, and there were records that went back, way back to the 1200s, precious documents that went up in flames during the Irish Civil War. Irish sports are fantastic. This is Irish football, not soccer. You kick it past the goalie, you get three points. You kick it over the top, you get one point. And this guy can pick it up and run for three steps, and then he can pass it to his buddy. So it's not soccer, a little bit different. 
Um, each county has their own colors. Um, the gentleman here in red is from County Cork. That's Cork in the Irish language. His wife is from County Kerry. Uh, that's Kerry in Irish. So this is a mixed marriage. Um, this is like a husky marrying a uh, cougar or a duck marrying a beaver. Um, yeah, they, they have a, a truce on weekends whenever their teams are playing each other. The kids from Kilkenny and their colors here. And this is my favorite game. This is hurling. This is a 2,000-year-old game that the Celts used to play. Very fast-moving game. Very rough-and-tumble game. This guy here has just hit the ball. You can see it going out there. This guy's just trying to block it with, uh, with his, his mallet there. Um, think about standing in front of, I don't know, Mark McGuire or Barry Bonds with a bat and trying to block their home run. It can be pretty, pretty, uh, a pretty rough game. Very exciting game, though. Oh, and horse racing and steeplechase are huge in Ireland. Uh, steeplechase was actually invented in Ireland, uh, where there was a race between two steeples across a horizon down in County Cork. So let's start moving around the island. This is right out of our guidebook. Each one of these little circles are towns where we list lodging, so we feel it's worthwhile to spend the night if you have the time. And here we go. So Powers Court Gardens are um, in County Wicklow, just uh, an easy hour's drive uh, south of Dublin. Beautiful Renaissance, Italian Renaissance gardens here at Powers Court. Glendalough is the, uh, uh, the uh, what am I trying to say, the monastery of St. Kevin, founded way back in the mid-500s. Also in County Wicklow, they call it the Garden County of Ireland. You'll see these round towers in these monastic settlements, very historic monastic settlements. All across the country, there's between 80 and 90 of them in varying states of repair uh, across the countryside. But you can figure that most of these towers are in the neighborhood of 1,000 years old. Kilkenny is our favorite um, interior town in Ireland. This is Kilkenny Castle, which is more of a palace now. Uh, it's a, it's a worth a visit if you are cutting through the interior. Cashel, though, is my favorite stop in the middle of Ireland. It's in County Tipperary. St. Patrick himself visited here. And last year, the Queen of England visited here. This is the first time since the Republic was founded in 1922 that the Queen set foot in uh, the Republic of Ireland. So it was a huge watershed moment. Um, and actually, she was better received than anybody really would have expected. It was a real cathartic moment in Irish history modern Irish history. If you're going to the Rock of Cashel, the crowds again are big in the middle of the day, so try and do it early in the morning or late in the afternoon um, to minimize the crowds. And you gotta bring extra film memory for your, for your camera. My tour members are always asking me halfway through the tour, you know, where can I buy another memory chip? I didn't bring enough memory, you know. Just do yourself a favor. Think of how much film, it's not film anymore, memory you want for your camera, and now double it because you're just gonna be taking tons and tons of photos and you don't wanna spend a bunch of your time trying to find a camera shop as you're traveling around. Waterford is actually an older town than Dublin. Uh, Dublin, Waterford, Limerick were all uh, founded by the Vikings. The very first towns in Ireland were uh, Viking settlements. But we know Waterford though for Waterford Crystal which went out of business in 2008 and then it was bought up um, by American investors who've reopened a new Waterford Crystal that's even more accessible and more interesting to tour than the old one. So if you're into Crystal, now you can walk down the assembly line and actually pick up the thing and talk to the guy and um, really get a feel for their craftsmanship. It's a smaller scale thing because most of their production is done by cheaper labor across the world, but the really most important and um, most intricate creations that they do are still done here in Waterford. Now, I love finding out about uh, different characters in Irish history. This is my favorite character in Irish history. Just indulge me here for a minute or so. This gentleman is named Thomas Francis Maher. He was born in Waterford in the 1830s. He became an Irish rebel in the 1840s as a young man. He's the guy who went to France and brought back that first Irish flag, the tricolor, as a rebel. He survived the famine. He was in an uprising. He was caught. He was sentenced uh, to death, but Queen Victoria commuted his sentence and banished him to Van Diemen's Land, which is Tasmania today, off the coast of Australia. He was there for three years. He got in a rowboat and escaped, got out in the shipping lanes, and an American whaling ship picked him up, 
got him to the state of New York. In New York, he started a newspaper. He became wealthy. He went down to Central America and started jaguar hunting and looking at the possibility of maybe creating what later became the Panama Canal. Then he heard the Civil War might start, so he ran back up to New York. He became a general and founded the fighting 69th Union Regiment that fought on the bloodiest day of the Civil War, which was Antietam in September of 1862. Had his horse shot out from underneath him, he survives the war, after the war, he becomes the first territorial governor of Montana, 10 years before Little Bighorn, and now he's about my age. <laughs> I'm out of breath just talking about him. Um, what happens to him? Well, he's on a riverboat in the Missouri River, falls overboard and drowns. And his body was never found. So somebody's got to make a movie about this guy. Um, he was everywhere, and um, if you've ever been to the state capitol in Montana, I always forget, Missoula or Helena? Helena, thank you. There's a statue of Thomas Francis Maher right there in front of the capitol building, but nobody knows where his body went. So Irish history starts with these stone circles, just the same uh, vintage as um, Stonehenge, but much more accessible and much more intimate. You can't walk up and touch Stonehenge very er easily, but you can these uh, stone circles in Ireland. There's over 200 of them spread across Ireland. And then from people, early man went from um, Stone Age, Stone Age tools, to the Bronze Age, where they began smelting tin and copper to make bronze. Uh, and uh, they were able to create axe heads, and then they figured out how to make iron, and you know, the ages progressed technologically. So about, oh, a thousand years before Christ, this would, this would have been the way Irish people were living. Now, about the time of Christ, in the Iron Age, if you were a wealthy Irish chieftain, you would build a fort out in a swamp like this, and your wealth was measured by how many cattle you had, how much land you had, and also how many slaves you had, because this was a slave trading economy. And St. Patrick himself was a kidnapped slave, kidnapped from the coast of Britain, they think maybe Scotland, they're not 100% sure, and uh, brought to Ireland for six years where he... Um, kind of found God and, and eventually escaped again and then had another vision that he should become a member of the clergy and come back and convert the Irish. He was not the first uh, Christian missionary to Ireland, but he was the most successful and, of course, the most famous. So when Christianity came to Ireland, um, it wasn't really at the point of a sword. It was through the persuasive powers of people like St. Patrick. Ireland is unique, perhaps, in Western European history in many ways for being converted to Christianity not with a crusade and not with the Inquisition or anything like that, but rather with uh, the persuasive powers of the early missionaries who would take um, nature and help to explain to the pagans, um, for example, the Trinity, uh, three in one, right? The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three in one. They'd take a shamrock, three petals on one stem, and they would explain the Trinity to the pagans, you know, people that way, and, and make it more palatable to them. Anyway, that's why the shamrock is one of the national, one of the, one of the symbols, I should say, most associated with Ireland. Now, in the 800s, here came the Vikings. We already talked a little bit about them raiding, and after a few years, instead of just raiding, they set up camps so they could trade with the Irish and, you know, rob them on a more regular basis. Uh, <laughs> And those, uh, those Vikings became the Normans within a couple hundred years. The Normans, the men of the north, the Norsemen, who had settled on the coast of France and Normandy and came across at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, took over Britain, and about 100 years later in 1169 came over at the invitation of a couple of Irish chieftains as sort of a military muscle uh, in the uh, 1160s and stayed and became uh, eventually uh, what evolved into the British. Uh, aristocracy or the English aristocracy in Ireland. When they landed on this beach, the Normans, this beach is called Bag and Bun, and there's an old Irish saying that goes, on the beach at Bag and Bun, Ireland was lost and won. Lost to the Irish and won to the English by the English for the next 700 years. Now, there's a little lighthouse, actually a big lighthouse, that was built by the Normans, and it still stands. It's a modern lighthouse today with a modern light on the top. But when Oliver Cromwell came through, um, with his British troops in a scorched earth policy to take over Ireland in the 1640s. He looked at Waterford, a very strategic town, and he said, on, he looked at the map and he said, I can either go through Hookhead by that lighthouse or I can go through the little town of Crook on the other side of the bay. I'm going to take Waterford by Hook or by Crook. That's where we get that. 
Oliver Cromwell, kind of the boogeyman of Irish history. And then there was the 1798 uprising with the pikemen who tried to rise up against the redcoats, but the redcoats had already lost the 13 colonies and were battle-hardened and were not going to give up Ireland. Ireland to the British was like Cuba to us in the 1960s. If you were trying to get at the British, let's say you were a French or a Spanish monarch who shared their Catholic faith with the Irish, they said, well, we'll get, to, we'll get at the British the back way through Ireland. So the British were not going to let that happen. They weren't going to let Ireland fall, and they put down this um, rebellion in 1798. 30,000 people died in six weeks in this rebellion, uh, the bloodiest Irish rebellion. In the 1840s, 1830s, the Irish were looked at in a very sort of bigoted way as uh, subhuman in many ways. This is a cartoon out of an English uh, uh, newspaper of the time, and when they came across to the States, they were portrayed very ape-like as well, very, very, you know, uncomplimentary ways. They were given the uh, most basic labor jobs, washerwomen or uh, ditch diggers and so on. But eventually, the Irish, the first mass migration of a European country, there are many other proud nationalities that came soon after, Italians and Germans and Poles and so on, but the Irish were the first major uh, influx of immigration into the States. Um, they made their names by helping to build the um, uh, the Transcontinental uh, Railway, they helped to build the Erie Canal, they helped to build some of the first skyscrapers in Chicago, they fought bravely on both sides of the Civil War, and uh, eventually we had our first Irish Catholic president. He was not our first Irish president, there were about 11 other Irish presidents before him, but they were Scotch-Irish from up in Ulster, or at least their heritage was from up north, and um, JFK was the first Irish Catholic president. So if your heritage is Irish, chances are good that your people got on a boat in this town. It's called Cove, C-O-B-H. Uh, and uh, that was the main port of emigration. It was also the last stop of the Titanic. In those days, the town was called Queenstown. Uh, it was renamed Cove after I the Irish got their independence. By the way, you guys, at 7.45 tonight, if you start feeling a little chilly, 7.45 tonight will be the 100th anniversary of the striking of that iceberg. Uh, the ship sank on April 15th of uh, 1912. And then three years later, the Lusitania sinks uh, right off the coast of uh, County Cork, uh, torpedoed by a, a World War I German U-boat. So lots of interesting uh, maritime history uh, here on the coast of County Cork. Our favorite town is Kinsale in that region. Beautiful little town, um, wonderfully painted. They have a contest called the Tidy Town Contest, and Kinsale has won that uh, more than once. It has a wonderful star-shaped fort that the British built to try and protect this strategic harbor from invasion by either the Spanish or the French. Great walking tour guides like this gentleman named Don Herlihy, who will tell you all about the local history. And again, we write this up in our guidebook. Blarney Castle is nearby. Uh, Blarney Castle, if you want to uh, kiss the Blarney Stone up near the city of Cork, you've got to climb up into the tower here, and right up here on this parapet, eight floors up, you've got to lean over backwards, and these bars will keep you from falling through, but you've got to kiss the stone, which supposedly will give you the gift of gab or the cold of the people who kissed it before you. <laughs> you've got to have a good back to do that. Uh, the Ring of Kerry is beautiful, but we like Kenmare much more than Killarney for a town to launch from. Here's the town of Kenmare. It's located right here on the Ring of Kerry, about a 130-mile loop. Killarney's over here. So we come from Kinsale, way over here. We come through Muckross and visit the mansion there, go over Malls Gap, and we get that part of the Ring of Kerry done on our entry day, spend the night here, get up early, and we drive this way around the Ring of Kerry. The convoy of buses will be going this way around the Ring of Kerry. So we don't want to be going this way because then your lasting memory of the entire trip will be the license plate number of the giant bus blocking your view. So we prefer to go the other way around, which is the way the locals do. Now, eventually, that convoy is going to meet you. But what you do is you go out on this little Skellig Ring Road, which is too narrow for the buses. The buses go this way. You have lunch and enjoy the views, and then you continue on like that. So that's the way we like to do it. Um, here's Steg Ring Fort, which is one of the Iron Age ring forts you can visit out on the Ring of Kerry. Here's passing one of the coaches. 
Now, they widen the road every single year. I've been back to this same exact spot, and this, they've dynamited out the rock on the right, and it's a wider road now. So the horror stories that you heard from relatives trying to drive this 30 or 40 years ago is, is outdated. It's really become much easier to drive. And now here's the Skellig Ring Road. Now, a coach could never drive this, but you can in your car to get away from, from the crowds. Looking off the, Skellig, or the coast here, you're looking out at the two Skellig Rocks, and the most magical thing I've ever done in Ireland is to take a boat trip out there. I've been out there a couple of times. 45-minute boat ride out there. The boats will not go if the seas are rough, and they'll know right from shore whether or not to go or not um, so you don't go halfway out and then turn around and come back. So let's go out there for a few minutes. Taking a boat ride out to Skellig Michael, named after the Archangel Michael. Uh, the monks built these little beehive huts right up here on the summit, and they lived out there from the mid-500s until the early 1100s, living off nothing but bird's eggs and rainwater and fish. A, a dark, damp, devoted, you know, life, trying to get away from all the temptations of the big cities, you know, or the, at least any city or any town. Um, so they lived out here on this, these rocks, and uh, they built these stairs. 600 vertical feet of stairs, no, no escalator, no railings, no coffee shop, no bathrooms, no nothing out there except for fantastic atmosphere and beautiful scenery. So you start climbing up these stairs that the, monk, the monks built, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and you've got puffins all around you. If you're there from mid-April until about the first couple weeks of August, you'll see puffins. And there, I didn't use a zoom lens on this. This is about, this puffin was maybe 10 or 15 feet away from me. Um, so you're climbing up the stairs and you're, you're puffing too. Um, <laughs> they're puffing. Everybody's puffing out here. Um, <laughs> a little more puffing. Uh, and uh, eventually you get to the top and there is a ranger up there who spends the summer and will explain these, these um, amazing stories of the monks who lived up in this area um, way off on what was then the edge of the known world. They didn't know about the North and South America. This was the edge of the world, as far away from civilization as they could get. There are the graves of the monks right here and a 600-foot drop right over the edge right there. Here's the trail. You know, you just got to have good footwear, keep your eyes open. You know, um, the Irish don't, you know, usually build railings. They take us all to be adults and be, you know, able to sort of you know, watch out for ourselves and, and just walk carefully. So now we're back on the mainland, and Killarney National Park is a beautiful national park along the way. Heading north, here's Muckross House on the way as well. A nice... Uh, mansion to visit in the, the Clarny National Park area. There's a folk park here with uh, thatched houses and so on, definitely worth visiting. And uh, the reconstruction of the original houses here, you learn that in the old days, people were taxed by how, how, how big their windows were because glass was a luxury. So in order to avoid taxes, you'd build a tiny little window. And the Irish called that daylight robbery. So um, that's... Uh, <laughs> Another thing that we get from the Irish. Um, Dingle is our favorite town on the West Coast, a beautiful little fishing village. And you can visit Fungi the Dolphin, who has adopted this, uh, this bay in Dingle Harbor. You can take boat cruises out there to uh, visit him. They're nuts about Fungi and Dingle. This is the loop that we like. This is the Slayhead Loop um, around... Um, around the tip of the Dingle Peninsula, and you get great, great, great scenery like this uh, out on the tip of the Slayhead Peninsula. Again, you can only do this by car. Rugged, rugged scenery out there. And uh, this is the westernmost point in Europe, Slayhead itself. Now, I took this picture in early August with one of my tour groups, and I came back to the same viewpoint two weeks later in mid-August. You can't outguess Irish weather. You just can't. Um, it could be like this or it could be like this. You never know. This is both August, all right? Uh, Oscar Wilde, the famous author, said that there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing, okay? <laughs> so if you're a sun worshiper, you know, Ireland's a gamble. 
Gawler's oratory, an early Christian um, oratory, um, almost 1,100 years old, beautifully constructed with no mortar. Those stones are just stacked on top of themselves. I love Irish pubs. They're the public living room of the people. Sometimes they're, you know, little communal um, houses like this out in the countryside. Sometimes they're romantic little places like this one in Kinsale, the, the uh, Spaniard pub in Kinsale. Sometimes they're very quiet and introspective, and sometimes they're kind of steamy and conversational and, and kind of loud and boisterous. But the thing I love most about Irish pubs, uh, beyond the beer, um, is uh, uh, the music. Um, wonderful Irish traditional music in these pubs. Uh, the musicians show up just for the love of the music. They're not getting big money for being here. They just know that on Thursday night, O'Flaherty's is the right place to, to play with their friends. And they also do church concerts in Dingle, so you can hear the same musicians in the pubs who you will hear later in the pubs, you can hear earlier uh, in the church in a more sort of serene setting. The Illin pipes are an Irish bagpipe. It has double the uh, number of, uh, has two octaves instead of one, unlike the Scottish bagpipe. And it's a very complicated thing to play. He has fingering here that's like a flute, but he's also hitting with his heel these different uh, drones on this here. He's got one bag under one arm to keep the air going and another bag on the other side like a bellows to pull it in. He's got five or six things he's doing with two arms. And in order to keep this thing in his lap, he's like wrestling with an octopus. He's got this thing in his lap. He's got a seat belt or a little belt to kind of hook it onto. Uh, and he's got two bags on either side. These guys joke that it's the safest instrument in the world to play because you've got a seat belt and two airbags. <laughs> Blasket Island, the great Blasket Island is off the tip of the uh, Dingle Peninsula. A wonderful uh, hiking area if you've got the time and nice weather. You'll see these round circles in different parts of the Irish countryside. These are old raths or ring forts that were built, again, roughly the time of Christ, in most cases for the Iron Age, to keep their cattle safe from other clan rustlers who would want to steal their, their cattle during times of war. You can walk around on the edges of these ring forts. And uh, there was a, an Irish folklorist who said, you know, these were built by the little people, the fairies, the little people. And it was bad luck to pull any stones away from the ring forts. They say the Kennedy family has had such a tragic, you know, um, series of generations because someone on their county Wexford farm must have taken a stone from the ring fort. Um, bad luck, right? Superstition. Well, anyway, they asked this woman, do you believe in fairies? And she thought for a second and she said, no, but they're there anyway. Irish logic. Cliffs of Moher, 700 foot tall um, cliffs right on the coast of uh, County Clare. Look at these people walking right up at the edge. I can barely even watch. Um, they don't build fences. The Irish just believe in natural selection. <laughs> There's a wonderful little holy well nearby, Bridget St. Bridget's Well. You can walk right in there and see all these wonderful artifacts that were left behind by people who were making offerings to the Virgin Mary. The Burren is a national park in Ireland there in County Clare, uh, a rocky, stony place. That's what the word Burren means in Irish. Here's an ancient dolmen burial mound uh, structure. The mound around it has been weathered away, but the interior superstructure of it still remains. The cremated remains of the royalty would have been, um, would have been put inside this way back, three, four, three and a half to 4,000 years ago. Great castles all across Ireland. One of my favorites is here at Dungura Castle, where you can do a castle banquet. The waiters and waitresses sing songs and tell jokes and then, uh, you know, serve your meals in between each song or each course. But really, it's the people that you meet in Ireland. I was talking to this guy. He was out in the burren. He was leaning against a stone wall. I know this sounds like a cliche, but I looked out there at that rocky ground and I wondered what it would be like to, to live here. And I, I said to him, have you lived here all your life? And he looked me right in the eye and he said, not yet. <laughs> okay, so we've come around the southern part here. We're in Galway now, and we're going to go across the north. But let's spend a few minutes in Galway and the Aran Islands and Connemara on our way north. Galway is a college town, a university town, a youthful, vibrant town. Um, so it's a good base for the West. 
Um, now, to get out to the Aran Islands, you can fly out. I've done that many times. But uh, normally, flying in, you get some great views of the three Aran Islands coming in. I like Inish more, the largest of the three most. But if you go in by boat, um, which is fine, it's about a 45-minute boat ride versus a 10-minute flight, um, the boats are subject to tides. So once you dock at 10 in the morning, you're, you're there until 5 or 6, 4 or 5 actually in the evening before the tide comes back in. This is where the Irish language is spoken most prevalently out on the Aran Islands. They'll speak English to you and me, but uh, they speak Irish to each other. This is where you find the thatched hut culture that we see so much in the postcards and that's unfortunately dying away, um, but you can still find it out here. This is where the Aran sweater comes from. Um, just remember to get your VAT tax form if you're buying crystal or sweaters or something expensive like that so that you can get a refund on the 20% tax that you'll be paying. Uh, a European is stuck with that. They, they can't do anything about it, but you, um, you guys can... Um, uh, you know, get a refund of about 20%, that VAT tax, by following the instructions we have in our guidebook and so on for getting that refund. Really slow uh, out on the Aran Islands, really relaxing. You'll make friends beside the road like, like this guy. You can compare dental work if you want. <laughs> but the way you get around on the island is by minivan. If it's raining, I get in a minivan. These guys are waiting right on the dock. You know, they're, they're hawking their wares, so to speak, and they'll drive you around the island for five or six hours for about 10 euros. You get the eight or 10 people in there, and it's a good deal. You can also get a, um, a, a little pony cart a driver to drive around the, on the island if the weather is good. It's slower, and it's twice as expensive, but it's uh, very romantic and relaxing. Or you can rent a bike and get around this way if you want. Um, they're relatively flat and easy to get around. You've got to worry about bandits along the road, though. <laughs> These guys will charge you a toll trying to get through past their corner here. <laughs> uh, the main site, though, is Dun Angus, uh, this Iron Age ring fort right on a cliff up there on Inish Moor. 2,000-year-old um, ring fort with these concentric ring walls, and then you look out here, and you see these, like, tank's teeth sticking out. These are man-made defensive structures, rocks that they carried with a ton of labor, like this. So if you're charging that fort, you got to tiptoe through these things, and by the time you get close to the walls, they'll have picked you off. So it was a lot of labor, but it certainly made them uh, very well fortified 2,000 years ago with the weaponry that was available at that time. You have uh, wonderful little um, uh, Kurok boats, uh, very maneuverable little boats that the Irish would fish from. Um, very light and easy to carry, but also very fragile. If they took a goat ashore or a sheep, they would have to lay the sheep or the goat on its back and tie all of its legs together so that it wouldn't kick a hole through the canvas and sink the boat. The rough and tumble, hardy people of the Aran Islands, you can just... Um, you can just read it on their faces, the, the, the um, no-nonsense, tough, and, you know, life that they lead out there. They literally, in the old days, had to manufacture dirt because it was only rock. So you had, they had to get sand and seaweed and animal dung and just start scraping it together to have a little plot of land to grow some vegetables in um, to have a more varied diet. So really hard scrabble life. The people have lived out there. This little young lady, I met her in 1981 on my first trip, and I was just a kid with a bicycle uh, right out of college. She was so cute, I stopped, and I said, can I take your picture? She said, okay. I snapped this picture, and I pedaled away. And whenever I'd show my pictures to my friends or relatives, they would um, see this picture, and they just thought he was, she was really cute. So when I uh, went back over there with my brother Tim in 1995, um, he said, great suggestion, Tim. He said, um, bring along a little photograph of her, see if you can find her. So I did. And uh, Tim and I are having our lunch in this little cafe before we start bicycling around, and I walk up to the cash register at this cafe, the only crossroads in town, the only cafe in, practically on the island, paying the bill, and then I pull out this picture, and I say, you know, I was here 14 years ago. Do you have any idea who this little girl is? And they looked at the picture, and they said, yeah, sure, that's Susie Gill. And I went, oh, cool, can you tell me where she is? I'd love to just show her the picture. And they said, yeah, sure, she's in the back cooking. We'll bring her out. <laughs> True story. True story. 
So she didn't remember me from Adam, but when she looked at the picture, she remembered her red galoshes, her little kitten, and she recognized her brother there in the back. So my whole point is just reach out to the Irish. You just never know what sort of magical, um, you know, magical interactions you'll have. Last time I talked to Susie, she uh, sent me a postcard from Australia. She was headed for Boston. I know that sounds like another cliche for the Irish, but um, she's out there uh, in the Irish diaspora, you know, moving around. Susie Gill. Okay, we're back on the mainland, moving north up through Connemara. Beautiful countryside in Connemara, moving north up the west coast. Some of the greenest, 40 shades of green, you probably heard that uh, cliche about Ireland, really is true out here in Connemara. This was the cover shot on our guidebook here a few years ago, one of my favorite little areas of Ireland, Connemara. Beautiful, uh, lush vegetation out here. This is in May when the rhododendrons are blossoming. The fuchsia start coming out in June. You get the Irish rose coming out roughly midsummer or a little bit earlier. You get heather, you know, all the way through the summer. Um, the uh, foxglove is growing as well in mid and late summer. And my favorite, you can't quite see it here, but this orange flower here is called Montbrecia. And that, uh, that grows luscious, lushly in, um, in August. So some great, wonderful flowers out there across the Irish countryside. But you'll also see signs like this. There are many famine graveyards all across Ireland. Just a quick little history thing here. In 1800, there were 4 million Irish in Ireland. In 1900, there were roughly 4, 4 million Irish. But in the middle of that century, in 1845, there were 8 million Irish. There was a huge population boom because of the potato. You could live off potatoes and buttermilk. You had enough vitamin C and vitamin A to survive. So peasants would grow potatoes in this rocky, wet ground and, you know, survive off that. But when a fungus started to kill the potatoes for four years in a row in the late 1840s, a million people died and another million and a half emigrated. And after that time, only the male one uh, eldest male got the land, and any other male had no choice other than to join the clergy or to emigrate. So with just one male staying home, the population started to go down again. So um, I think Ireland is unique in history as well as being the only nation to double its population and cut it in half um, in a, in a hundred-year span. And it wasn't by warfare, it was by uh, the dependence on the potato. So here's a healthy potato field. And... Uh, here is a ghostly remnant of an old potato field from the famine. They call these lazy beds. And I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, and I'm realizing that in the old days, Ireland was much more densely populated, and people were living way up these slopes. And you can still see where they were living from the scars of the lazy beds from 150 years ago. And, of course, they, they commemorate that with uh, a variety of memorials across the country. Okay, let's get off that heavy subject. A friend of mine calls a, a pint of Guinness the tall blonde in the black dress. <laughs> now, um, there is a subculture in Ireland called travelers. We used to call them tinkers, but that's derogatory now. It's politically incorrect, you call them travelers. 30,000 of them living nomadically across Ireland. Sometimes they're called gypsies, but they're not ethnically gypsies at all. They're as Irish as Irish can be. They were displaced during the famine and displaced during the Cromwellian Wars and just adopted a, uh, a, 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 a nomadic lifestyle. And they live in these little trailers that they move around every so often from halting site to halting site. Uh, travelers. And then out in the west and in the center of Ireland, you have these bogs where they literally cut peat or turf out of the bogs, they let it dry, and then they burn it like presto logs in their fireplace, which would have been all you would have needed to grow your potatoes as a peasant. Go to the bog, cut some turf, let it dry, and then you can boil the water to, to boil your potatoes. The Irish, by the way, the Irish peasants would have one long thumbnail, and that was to peel the potato because they were too poor for silverware. Dirt poor, literally. Out in the bogs, you can still see um, um, these plants called sundew. Um, they're carnivorous plants, like a Venus flytrap, because the bogs don't have enough nutrients in the soil, so the plants have to get their nutrients from other places. Here's one of my tour groups. We're out in front of Kyle Moore Abbey. Our tour groups are usually roughly 25 people in a group. Um, this is our whole tour itinerary all across Western Europe. Here's Ireland up here. 
Um, our Ireland tour spends a couple nights in Dublin, two in Kinsale, three in Dingle, two in Galway with a trip out to the Aran Islands, one in Westport, two up in Portrush, and one back in Dublin. So that's our best two-week itinerary. By the way, if you don't want to take one of our tours, we have a consulting service as well, which you can do in person or by phone. Uh, and we can help you plan an independent trip if you prefer not to do a tour. But we feel our tours are really packing in the best uh, that you can see in a couple weeks' time. Think about this. When you're traveling independently, you're going to spend 25% of your time figuring out where to sleep and where to eat uh, and how to get from A to B. On a tour, that's all figured out for you. So a tour is more efficient. You'll see in three days on a tour what it would take you four days to see on your own because it's all figured out for you. So you have to balance that against the compromise of living by the schedule of the tour. By the way, um, we have a special going today. If you, spend, uh, or if you decide you want to sign up for a tour, you can get $100 off by, by signing up today. Just consider that. And our tours, again, are, are active tours. We um, um, have fun-loving, easy-going, flexible, open-minded people on our tours because we're very upfront in saying how active our tours are. You have to carry your own bags, and it, you might not have an elevator in a building that might be three floors tall. So that filters out people who want that extra sort of someone to carry their bags kind of thing. Um, and they're, you know, God love them. There are other tour companies that would cater to that, and that's great. We're, our niche, though, is a little bit different. We try to have one open seat on the coach, one extra open seat for every person. So if we have 25 people on a tour, we've got 50 seats on a coach, generally speaking. So everybody can spread out and have an empty seat next to them. And these are my colleagues. There's about 75 of us who lead tours across Europe. About half of us are Europeans, and about half of us are either American or Canadian. Our tour brochure, as I may have mentioned, we've got it out there for you to, to grab if you're interested. And inside the tour brochure, we have our um, uh, CD, um, or DVD, I should say, that's about 45 minutes long that goes along on one of our tours, so you can kind of see our style. And, of course, this is all free if you're interested uh, out in the lobby. And also on our website at ricksteves.com. Ricksteves.com, for those of you watching right now on Facebook, um, you can just dial that up anytime and, and look, at our, um, look at our specials. Our guidebooks. This is the guidebook that I co-write with Rick. Uh, the TV shows he's filmed and our other guidebooks are packed with good, useful information. One of my very favorite guidebooks is this one, Europe uh, 101, which is the art and history guidebook that my colleague Gene Openshaw wrote. He'll be giving the talk later this afternoon about Michelangelo. Now, we're back on the mainland of Ireland, and I'll speed it up because I don't want to keep you here too long. Uh, Crow Patrick is the mountain that St. Patrick supposedly banished the snakes from. Now, there were never any snakes in Ireland. Okay, they never made it across the land bridge at the, at the end of the last ice age. But the symbolism here is that, that he was replacing the pagan beliefs with Christian beliefs. You know, the pagan beliefs, the serpent like the Garden of Eden, you know, serpent's bad. So uh, that's, that's the symbolism there. You can climb this mountain. I've done it a couple times. It's 2,500 feet. And, uh, and uh, you know, a relatively straightforward climb. Um, about 20,000 pilgrims do this on the last Sunday in July every year called Reek Sunday to hear Mass set up on the summit. There's the little church on the summit. I did that pilgrimage back in 1981. And uh, you get great views from the top, looking down on Clue Bay. And you can see people of any age do this. Um, so it's not a technical climb in any way, but it is 2,500 feet straight up through the rocks. If you're truly devout, you do it barefoot. Yeah. Okay, Westport is our favorite base town uh, at the northern end of uh, Connemara. Westport I like a lot, and my favorite pub there is Matt Malloy's. He's the flute player for the Chieftains. If you've ever seen the Chieftains in concert, they come to Seattle. When he's not traveling around, he is uh, attending the bar here in Westport, Matt Malloy. So we've come along up here, and we're going to head north. Here's the border of Northern Ireland, those six counties of the north. We've gone into the United Kingdom when we enter Northern Ireland. And it'll stay that way as long as the majority of the people want it to be that way. There's about a 55-45 split between the Unionist people who happen to be Protestant and the Nationalist people who happen to be Catholic. The Unionist people want to remain part of the Union with Britain, the United Kingdom. The Nationalist people were displaced when the British moved in 400 years ago and planted Ulster, and they want it to be Irish. So it's really not about the religion. They're not debating about the Pope's teachings. They're debating really about 
do we want to be British or do we want to be Irish? And you, uh, Northern Ireland is quite unique because if you're born there, you get to choose your passport. You can choose an Irish passport or a British passport. Your choice. Some amazing uh, American um, movers and shakers, leaders came, or at least their heritage was from the north. Woodrow Wilson, Andrew Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant, just to name a few there. The Scotch-Irish who came across. Scotland first, and then a few generations in the north of Ireland. And then they came across to the 13 colonies. And then when they couldn't find the land they wanted, they were the first ones to go over the Appalachians into Kentucky and Tennessee and fight the Indians there, people like Davy Crockett and Andrew Jackson's kin. Well, these people were followers of a king named King William of Orange, King Billy. So when they came across, their hero, King Billy, these guys were called Billy Boys. And then they decided, since they couldn't find the land anymore that they wanted in the 13 colonies, they would go over the hills, over the Appalachians. Some of them settled in the Appalachians, hill billies. So that's, that's, that's where we get that term. And if you listen to Appalachian bluegrass and you listen to Irish music, you can hear the similarities. Now, one of the interesting things in the north is the British pounds. This is a British pound from England. These are British pounds from Scotland, issued by three different banks. These are British pounds issued by three different banks in Ireland. All of these bills are worth 10 pounds sterling, but all seven bills look different. So it's kind of a different system up there. Now, um, Derry or Londonderry, a walled town, one of the last walled towns built in Europe in the early 1600s. Uh, one of my favorite towns in the north. When I was in high school, this is all I saw on TV was... Um, uh, you know, the troubles. Right after the Vietnam War stuff started to go down, suddenly stuff was going on in Ireland. What was that about, you know? Well, uh, it was about uh, the Irish people of the North hearing about our civil rights movement. Believe it or not, Martin Luther King is a big hero to the Catholic nationalist community over there. They saw it on TV. TV was new. They started to emulate that, and it, these, these, it's a long story, but basically these civil rights marches became... Um, persecuted or at least, uh, you know, um, um, people on the marches were beat up by the people who didn't want things to change and the troops had to come in and it got ugly for, for 30 years. But since 1998, the Good Friday Peace Agreement, things have really settled down. It's kind of two steps forward, one step back kind of a process. Today, that same neighborhood looks like this. I feel completely safe walking through the Bogside neighborhood of, uh, of Derry or London Derry. And the murals of these people's heroes are painted um, there on, those, on the sides of the, the walls in their area. Now, I was here in 1981 during the hunger strikes of Mays Prison, one of the ugliest periods in, in Irish, Northern Irish history. Uh, 25th day of the hunger strike for Bobby Sands. He died on hunger strike, and so did the nine guys after him. Uh, really, really ugly time. Very, very, very tense. But the same neighborhood today, again, is, is looking much better. I want to point out to you, though, this flag right up here. That is a Palestinian flag. Why? Well, the people of this community relate to the Palestinians. These people want to be Irish. There's the Irish flag, but they're stuck inside the United Kingdom. And they feel it's unjust. This community feels that way. So they relate to the Palestinians who are trapped within an Israeli state. And so their perspectives are similar. So you go across the tracks, and what do you see? These people who are unionists, they feel like the 13 or however many tribes it was of Israel who moved across and finally found their homeland and feel justified in staying there. And it's also kind of a knee-jerk reaction, you say black, I say white kind of a thing. But um, yeah, it's very interesting um, in the north. In the unionist communities, they have red, white, and blue curbstones, the colors of the uh, Union Jack flag, and they say, no surrender, we're going to hold this turf, kind of a siege mentality. In the other community, they see kids throwing Molotov cocktails back in the 70s as having been heroes rather than terrorists. Two different points of view. Depends on where you were born. This little girl was the 100th victim of the Troubles. She was uh, killed accidentally by a ricochet bullet. When the mural painters painted this, and when I first started going here, the butterfly was blank and the gun was black and solid. They said, if we ever feel that peace has taken hold, we will finish this mural. And about five years ago, I went back and I'm telling you, I was moved almost to tears because suddenly the mural had been finished. They put the colors of life into the butterfly. They broke the gun and they pointed it towards the earth, meaning it, the guns are dead. And, you know, things are, you know, not 
you know, perfect, obviously. There's still sectarian tensions, but getting much, much better. T two communities reaching out to each other, hands across the divide, the symbolism here. Hopeful. My friend uh, Stephen McPhillamy, in the old days, we would take our walks up here, and we'd see British military towers and troops on patrols and listening posts up here. We were walking around. It's only about 10 years ago, and this camera was panning around watching us. And so Stephen said, don't worry, everybody, just relax and turn to the camera and wave. So we all turn, 25 of us, and we wave, right? And all of a sudden, the camera stops. <laughs> and the little windshield wiper then goes, the guy's waving to us. <laughs> you know, he's just a bored conscript going, oh, let's see if there are any pretty girls on the tour today, right? <laughs> By the way, this, this is gone now too, uh, but I just had to show you a photograph of the way things used to be. Now, in the north, I quite often get around by train, um, and I was dying for a cup of coffee here in the dairy, London Dairy train station. I walked inside. There was no place to buy a cup of coffee except this. And you know what? It tasted just like coffee out of a vending machine. <laughs> so, you know, we, we look over there, we think leprechauns. They look over here, they think Starbucks. Okay, you can tell which neighborhood you're in. Red, white, and blue, red, white, and blue um, colors all over. God save the queen. You know that this is a unionist town. Red, white, and blue curb stones and a Union Jack flag. Red, white, and blue bus stop. Red, white, and blue tree and get your hair done like the queen, okay? <laughs> so you know which side of the fence you're on. And then we like to stay in a town like Port Rush up on the northern coast, a nice little relaxed town near Bushmills Distillery, the oldest dis whiskey distillery in the world. Take a hike at the Kerikareed Rope Bridge, beautiful northern Irish coastline up there. The Giant's Causeway is another uh, protected area here with this unique geology here. Just fantastic scenery in the north. Do go to Northern Ireland. It's beautiful up there. Uh, one of my favorite castles here, which is Dunluce Castle on the northern coast. You can see Scotland on a clear day across the water there. And last but not least, we're heading into Belfast. This is the um, City Hall of Belfast. Uh, this was bombed during the war. The shipyards were bombed during the war. The Luftwaffe saw the shipyard might of the north, and they were... Um, trying to, you know, destroy the British war effort, which Belfast was a big part of. Again, just to mention, again, it's not about religion. It's about uh, whether or not you want to be British or Irish. Religion is brought into it by those who want to stir the pot and stir up trouble. Now, this is their Northern Irish Parliament building, and the reason that the flags are at half-staff is because I took this picture on 9-11. We all remember where we were and this is where I was. And the people of the North could not have been friendlier to us because they'd been living through 25 years of the possibility of terrorism. So they were very sympathetic to what we were just encountering, really, for the first time in our history. The shipyards of the North where the Titanic were built, was built, I should say. Uh, there it is, the 100th anniversary of the Titanic sinking tonight. Um, commemoration. And also the DeLorean was built here, if you remember the DeLorean. So, so don't judge Northern Ireland's workmanship on those two failures. <laughs> there are literally t-shirts that are selling like hotcakes this year in Belfast. And it says, Titanic. It was okay when it left here. <laughs> they got a point. Um, Okay, and uh, black taxi tours. I love to take a black taxi tour around town to sort of hear the locals, um, you know, explain their murals. Um, there's a, uh, some great guys who do both communities. We write them up in the book so you get an even-handed view of both communities. The Northern Irish flag, which is the cross of St. George, the loyalty of the crown, and the five or the six points of the northern six counties of the north, and then this mysterious Red Hand, which goes back to a story called the Red Hand of Ulster. Two clans were trying to row to shore. They were fighting each other. First guy to touch the shore gets the land. They're rowing, they're rowing, they're rowing, and as they're just almost ready to touch the shore, they're neck and neck, but the guy in the boat that is behind sees that he's not going to make it. He pulls out his sword, chops off his hand, and chucks it onto the shore. 
and touches the shore first. This is the legend, right? This is mythology. But the idea is, you know, the, the people of the north are tough hombres, and they're going to get it done no matter what. The red hand of Ulster. You'll see that red hand symbol all over the place in the north, all over the place. And some of the murals are pretty intended to be intimidating and kind of in your face. Um, this is a unionist, loyalist community area called the Shank Hill, using kind of like coming out of the trenches like World War I. And then in other neighborhoods, they give you the soft sell. Um, this is an IRA guy by the name of Bobby Sands. I mentioned him earlier. He died on hunger strike in 81. But here, it's, he's smiling and, you know, hey, the laugh, our revenge will be the laughter of our children. It's the soft sell versus the hard sell. Um, two, different, two different ways to kind of spin it. And it is both being spun on either side. But now today, Belfast is a booming town, and not in the old way of booming, uh, but uh, it's really a growth, growth, growth town now. I'm not talking about bombs. Um, the uh, condos are being built, a new Hilton Hotel. There's a brand new sports stadium here. They wanted to bring in a sport that would be uh, good for both communities. They couldn't make it hurling, that's too Irish. Couldn't make it cricket, that's too British. So what sport did they bring in? Can you think of any sport that's about brotherly love, like hockey? <laughs> but yet it works. The communities have no history with hockey, so they both come together and it works. Belfast Giants hockey team. Okay, and one of my favorite pubs in the north is the Crown Liquor Saloon. Mr. Flanagan got married. He was Catholic, she was Protestant. They had an argument. What should we name our pub? She said, it's got to be the crown. And she was loyal to the queen or the king. It's got to be the crown. And he lost the argument. He said, okay, we can name it the crown. But only as long as people can wipe their feet on it as they walk in the front door. <laughs> so you got the friendly guys at the crown pouring you a pint. So you sit in a snug and kind of contemplate what you've seen in the north. Now we're leaving the north back in the republic. One or two more sites here. Here's Trim Castle right in the town of Trim. This is where the movie Braveheart was filmed. About Scotland, but filmed in Ireland. Those guys with the blue faces were all Irish soldiers on leave as extras. Great little festivals. Look at the Irish tourism website uh, to find out what may be going on when you're in town. The Hill of Tara, where the kings of Ireland were crowned way back in the Dark Ages and way back 2,000 years ago. St. Patrick with the shamrock. Um, again, the symbol, one of the symbols of Ireland. A high cross here at Monaster Boyce. The people were, were um, given the, the stories of the Bible. They were illiterate, so they couldn't read the Bible. So the abbots or the priests would carve into these stones the stories of the Bible. So, for example, you have here Eve giving an apple to Adam in the Garden of Eden. There's a snake going up here. You've got Cain slaying Abel with a mallet to the head. So these are the stories of the Bible. This cross is uh, 900 years old. And the last and biggest, uh, one of the oldest, most important sites in Ireland is here at Newgrange. This is a burial mound built before the pyramids, almost 5,000 years ago. When people first were efficient enough to stop hunting and gathering and start building things to last, uh, you know, they'd built things like this to honor their dead. And they were so advanced that they were able to line up this opening right here to the one spot where on the shortest day of the year, the sunlight would penetrate the inner chamber. December 22nd. They were that advanced to do that, and they had their cremated remains of their royalty inside, so their, the sun would carry the spirits of the dead off on that beam of light, and the gods would be pleased, and then from that moment on, the days would get longer, and then they could grow their crops and have a warm summer and survive. If they didn't please the gods, as far as they knew, it would be darker and darker and longer and longer dark and colder. So they were able to do that. They built this amazing uh, mound. Right here, the light shines right through that chamber, and they built this over 5,000 years ago. A really incredible workmanship. Right down into the inner chamber, you can enter in there. And uh, it's a very atmospheric place. So in closing, I just want to say that it's the character of the Irish people who keep me coming back. Okay, it's the beer too. <laughs> Do you see the shamrock and the suds on the top there? The bartender will kind of move the cup underneath the dripping uh, uh, um, tap there. It's the music of Ireland, for sure, that keeps me coming back. It's the people you meet. These guys were at the Bush Mills Distillery. They were a Finnish biker gang. 
nicest guys in the world, but they, you know, they look like hell's angels. They asked me to take their picture, and I said, only if I can have my picture taken with you. I don't know if you can pick me out in the crowd there or not, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's the traditions of Ireland that keep me coming back, like this young lady at a First Holy Communion. It is the humor of the Irish. <laughs> and it's the mythology of the Irish, like the leprechaun. You know, it's the optimistic spirit, too, uh, in Ireland, because uh, they've had a boom economy, and then it went back down, and now they're fighting their way back out of it again. So I just want to thank you very much for coming today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks a lot, folks. And again, just remember that we've got this 20% sale going on today over in our travel center. And for those of you watching on Facebook, thanks very much. You can use that uh, uh, festival promo code until uh, 6 o'clock in the evening tonight. Cheers.